I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, and you can think of uh, Clint Bullock as a litigator for liberty and a champion for school choice. In 2003, American Lawyer recognized Bullock as one of three lawyers of the year for a successful defense of school choice programs. He is currently the president of litigation at Arizona's Goldwater Institute, which is a sister think tank for the Georgia Public Policy Foundation. Among his many other endeavors that you can read in your brochure uh, with his bio, he co-founded the Institute for Justice. Some of you may know that the Institute for Justice is uh, changed the nation's perception of eminent domain when it took the Kelo versus New London case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And although they lost the war, they won the battle because states all across the nation toughened their private property protections, including, I'm proud to say, Georgia. Many of you here were here to help us in that, um, with that legislation. The uh, Goldwater's litigation division files lawsuits against all levels of government to protect taxpayers and businesses from government overreach. At the Goldwater Institute, he continues to be a champion of school choice, and Clint is here today to talk about that uh, with regard to Georgia. Help, get, help me give him a warm welcome, Clint Bullock. Thank you for being here, Clint. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations for this wonderful event. Jan, thank you for everything that you've done for school choice here in Georgia. So good to see you all so bright and early in the morning. I like to think of myself as having the best lawyer job in the entire country. I get to choose my clients. I get to choose my cases. I don't have to charge anything for the services I provide. But best of all, the people I get to sue are bureaucrats. <laughs> Man, that makes me feel good. Right now, uh, we have actually an odd situation in my house. I'm a, a lawyer who sues politicians, and my wife just won the nomination uh, to uh, the Republican nomination for a legislative seat in Arizona. It's the only district that Mitt Romney carried that uh, is represented right now by a Democrat. And I used to refer to Shauna as my better half. I now refer to her as the one politician I hope to never have to sue. Um, I, rem I was just thinking this morning when uh, I was getting ready to talk about the first time I was ever in Georgia when I was a teenager, and I remember there was a, a really huge election going on then as well. There was a guy named Carter running for governor and a guy named Nunn running for the Senate. My, how times have changed here in Georgia. <laughs> um, first, I, I want to congratulate you all for being a part of so many exciting things that are happening here in Georgia. Uh, recently, uh, the Goldwater Institute had a, a partnership uh, with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and, and many in the legislature in uh, helping Georgia become the second state in the United States to join the Compact for America. And when states join together um, in common cause, I think that we can send a very, very powerful message to Washington, D.C. Most of all is the incredible progress that you have been making in school choice. In charter schools, of course, you are becoming one of the, the leading states in the entire country. And on your scholarship tax credits, enabling kids to go to private schools, uh, as many of you know, the cap on that program this year was met in three weeks. That is a powerful sign of people voting for their feet people voting or for their feet, with their feet, uh, people voting for school choice, for parental autonomy. I hope that the legislature will lift the cap to enable many more families to, to follow in that uh, very, very positive path. Today, I'd like to tell you about two exciting ideas that have come out of Arizona, out of the Goldwater Institute, that I hope that Georgia will pursue as well. Uh, the main one relates to school choice, but I'm going to start out with something else uh, that you may have heard about that's very, very exciting um, that, uh, that we got going earlier this year. It's called Right to Try. And basically what it is is a state law that allows terminally ill patients 
to access experimental drugs uh, that have passed the first stage of FDA approval. And uh, we uh, have this on the ballot in Arizona this year. I expect that it will pass overwhelmingly. Uh, but we decided to test market this idea in a number of other states, and we chose Missouri, Louisiana, and Colorado, a real cross-section of states, two Democratic governors, one Republican. And you would think that there would be some very powerful opposition to this idea. After all, you know, uh, drug, uh, uh, drug access is, is supposedly a, a federal issue. Um, and I'm really, really excited to say that Right to Try was passed in each of those three states unanimously without a single dissenting vote. When is the last time that you heard a bold idea attracting both Democratic and Republican support? This week, it passed the Michigan Senate. And uh, obviously, if the FDA wanted to fight back, it could give us one heck of a, of a fight on federal preemption grounds. But what I think is going on on this issue is that there is a tsunami going on in the states, and it is simply going to, uh, it, it's simply going to take the FDA and its, its incredibly ossified drug approval process with it. Um, a number of drug companies, it takes 10 years and a billion dollars to approve a drug in uh, the FDA. And so as you can imagine, a lot of the drug companies are apprehensive about this and they're thinking, shoot, even if this passes, should we make the drugs available in the experimental stage? After all, the FDA may be very upset about that. And there's a guy in New York whose name is Richard Garr, who runs a company called Neuralstem, which has a very, very promising uh, medication for Lou Gehrig's disease. And it's gone through the first phase of FDA approval, which is the safety phase. And it, uh, it looks like it'll be another seven years before the drug is approved. The clinical trial was, had smashing results. Very, very promising. But only about a dozen people got to be in that clinical trial. And there are 50,000 people with Lou Gehrig's disease. And Richard Garr has announced that he is going to go to Colorado and he's going to make this drug available now, even though he is really rolling the dice with the FDA by doing that. And the reason for that is he says that every single day he gets letters and emails from people with Lou Gehrig's disease and they ask to be in the clinical trial and he cannot make the drug available to them. And the thing about all of these people who are looking to him for extending or saving their lives is that by the time the FDA approves this drug, every single one of them will be dead. And he cannot, in good conscience, allow that to happen. This is one of those issues where reform has been stymied for decades in Washington. And so we at the states have taken the lead in saying, we're going to free things up here. Whatever mess you have going on in Washington, DC, we're going to protect liberty. <laughs> Obviously, we've been doing it in education. We've doing, been doing it in private property rights. We desperately need to do it in healthcare as well. So I hope that, uh, that Georgia will join us in, uh, in supporting the right to try. But the issue uh, that I really wanted most to talk to you about today is the latest phase in the education revolution. I like to call the idea vouchers on steroids. The idea is called education savings accounts and it was born of necessity. We adopted a school voucher program in Arizona several years ago, and it was targeted to kids with disabilities and to uh, uh, kids in foster care. The idea of having a foster care school voucher was that these kids move from home to home, and it really uh, often disrupts their lives. If they could have a school that they could stay at, and have a community and an extended family in their school, that would just not only 
uh, give them greater educational opportunities, but stability as well. Unfortunately, our voucher program was struck down under our state's Blaine Amendment. And Georgia, too, has a, a Blaine Amendment. I know they, the scholarship tax credits are being litigated under that right now. Um, and unfortunately, uh, and, and in most states, I'm, I'm happy to say, vouchers have survived the Blaine Amendment challenge. And, and I think that tax credits, as they did in Arizona, will survive here in Georgia. Uh, but vouchers were struck down by the Arizona Supreme Court under the reasoning that the only place that you can use a voucher is a private school. And for that reason, the Supreme Court, erroneously in my opinion, but nonetheless concluded uh, that this violated the Blaine Amendment. So we went back to the drawing board in, at the Goldwater Institute and we thought to ourselves, what if you could use a voucher not just in private school, but in any educational setting. And that led us to the idea of education savings accounts. And uh, we uh, got them adopted in Arizona initially for the very same kids, kids with disabilities and kids in foster care. And the more we thought about education savings accounts, the more we thought this is an incredibly exciting and important way to go with education reform. When you think about K-12 education, and my friend uh, uh, George Pendleton last night gave me this metaphor, if you brought someone back from the 1800s and, and you brought them here to the year 2014, they would recognize almost nothing about the country that, that we live in, you know, the, the incredible technological leaps and, and the changes that we've made. The one thing they would recognize is the schools. They're really basically the same as they were in the late 1900s. Bricks and mortar, kids sitting in regimented rows, all learning the same thing at the same time. If we were designing a K-12 education system today from scratch, with no preconceptions about what it should look like, and knowing that we have amazing technology today, would it look anything like the bricks and mortar, top-down, bureaucratic, ossified, reform-resistant, command and control, special interest dominated system that represents the worst example of socialism west of China and south of the United States Postal Service? I hope that the answer is an emphatic no, because we now have the technology to deliver a high quality education at a fraction of the cost of what, how we're delivering it to today to every school child in the country. The teachers unions fret about class size, and, and of course, lower class sizes means more teachers, hence more union members. But what's the proper class size when you have a teacher like Jaime Escalante, perhaps the, the most gifted math teacher in the history of our country? Should he teach 20 kids, 30 kids? What about millions of kids? And we have that technology. You look at what uh, Salman uh, Khan is doing with, the, with the, the Khan Academies, where kids are going online and learning all sorts of advanced subjects. But we don't have a public policy that accommodates that. Even school vouchers, even scholarship tax credits allow you to go to a different type of school. And they're incredibly important because they inject powerful choice and competition into the system. But they don't enable people to take advantage of the tremendous technological revolution that we have around us. Education savings accounts do. Here's how they work. If you're an eligible child and leave the public school, the state deposits 90% of what it would have contributed to your education into a savings account. It's like a health savings account. It can be used for any educational purpose. It can be used for private school tuition, but it also can be used for distance learning. It can be used for tutoring. It can be used uh, for computer software. It can be used to purchase discrete classes or activities at public schools or at community colleges. 
And best, or not best of all, but another benefit is that if you don't use all of the money in your accounts by the time you graduate, you get to use it for college. So just think about what this would mean for low-income kids who would have an array of choices and if they were wise in, in expending their money, they would also have a step ahead when uh, they decided to go to college. Well, we tried this idea in Arizona, as I mentioned. We got it passed, and predictably, one of the rules we now know is that if you pass an education reform and it doesn't get challenged in court, you probably haven't accomplished anything. So when you see the lawsuit, pat yourselves on the back because it means that you've really pissed somebody off and it's people you wanted to piss off. So the people who have been uh, using the educational system for their own purposes, their own agendas over all of these years. Well, education savings accounts got challenged in court by the same people who challenged our voucher program. And guess what? They lost. The very same courts that had struck down vouchers said, no, this is not about religious schools. Religious schools are only one of the choices that are available with education savings accounts. You can use them for a variety of educational purposes. Since then, we expanded the program uh, to kids in D and F graded public schools and also to the children of military personnel so that 200,000 kids in Arizona are now eligible for education savings accounts. Obviously, it is a different idea, and it is one uh, that is taking uh, a lot of effort to educate people on, but as more and more people become aware of it, this is really uh, creating an education revolution in Arizona. Last year, Florida became the second state to adopt education savings accounts, in this case for severely disabled kids. And the Florida Education Association has taken that case to court. And it's just a, a classic confrontation between the special interest groups on the one hand and one of the most vulnerable uh, uh, groups of students in the, in the entire state on the other. And when the parents talk about the education savings accounts, they talk about the very special needs that their kids have. They are about as far as one si from one size fits all as you can possibly get. And the education savings accounts have enabled these parents to customize an education precisely to their children's needs. Well, this case goes to trial court uh, next uh, next Wednesday, I will be in Tallahassee uh, defending the program on behalf of the uh, parents of the kids in that program, and I am hoping that we will have the same success in court there uh, as we did in Arizona. I think that this is one of the important uh, parts of the education reform toolbox. Uh, I think that you can't possibly have enough choices for parents. But in terms of a fundamental shift in uh, how education is provided at the K-12 level, education savings accounts are a real paradigm shift. Instead of the state being a monopoly provider of K-12 education, they continue to provide an option uh, but the education savings accounts simply fund and enable education to take place and allow kids to take advantage of, of, of whatever uh, opportunities our market provides. When we think about where we stand in the world in terms of our K-12 educational system, I don't like looking up at countries like Lithuania and Poland. And we cannot afford to do that for much, uh, for much longer. Last year, uh, former Governor Jeb Bush and I, um, we've worked a lot together on education reform. We uh, co-authored a, a book on immigration reform together. And one of the things uh, that we found that was so frustrating is that uh, in the high-tech area, we are producing only a fraction 
of the uh, graduates that we need for the high-tech jobs uh, that, that fuel so much of our economy. So we have to do one of two things. We either have to import the workers who will fill those jobs, or we need to export the jobs. And right now, we are doing very little of the former and very much of the latter. If you go to the Silicon Valley right now, you will see a billboard where it says, got visa problems? Come to Canada, because we will allow, we will, uh, allow you to come and, and work here. Well, we can solve that problem by creating an education system that is among uh, uh, the best in the country. My son uh, goes to a charter school um, in uh, Phoenix called Basis. It's part of uh, a larger group of schools. It now has schools in uh, DC and Texas as well. My friend Glenn Delk is hoping to attract a, a Basis school uh, here to Atlanta. And um, it is a charter school. Um, it is, as are all charter schools, open to everyone. And last year, my son's sixth grade curriculum in, uh, encompassed, um, encompassed English, art, history, algebra, biology, chemistry, physics, and Latin. This was a sixth grade curriculum. I didn't have that in 12th grade. I can't help him with any of his homework except history. But, and this is, you know, the, 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 the most special thing about this is not the kid, but the opportunity that he has. And uh, when they open, opened up in Washington, D.C., uh, the, the bureaucrats there said, you know, we love the basis idea, but your, your curriculum is too accelerated for our kids. So you're going to have to have a two-track system one for the smart kids and one for the regular kids. And, and the, uh, the founder of Basis, Michael Block, said, you know what? You don't understand what we're doing. If you give us kids in fifth grade, by 12th grade, they will have passed 10, P, 10 AP examinations, and they will be competing with the brightest kids in China. It is not, uh, it is not for the super smart kids, it is for kids who have not been sufficiently challenged before. And when I look at what my son, and this, this year in seventh grade, he's taking, we, we, uh, his mom and I uh, urged him to take an easy language once he, we ha he had a choice of a language because we wanted him to have at least one easy class. And my son, like I think most kids, in the country has uh, oppositional personality disorder. And the way he defied us was by taking Mandarin. And he is loving it. He is flourishing. Just imagine, and, and I, I feel like I'm one of the few parents who can say that my kids' public school education blows away my public school education. Almost no one can say that. But with school choice, with vigorous charter schools, with the opportunity for kids to go to private schools, and with education savings accounts that allow us to harness the technology of the 21st century, our kids will surpass our educational achievements. They will compete with the best and the brightest around the world, and they will restore American greatness and excellence, and we can ask nothing less. For those of you who have been involved in education reform, you know it is not easy. The institutional inertia that is built around school districts and, and fueled by the teachers unions and their incredible political clout is not to be lightly regarded. And over the years of litigating school choice cases, um, which now goes, goes back uh, over 20 years, I've lost more rounds than I've won. Fortunately, we won in the United States Supreme Court, and we've won in a majority of state Supreme Courts around the country, but there have been a lot of, a lot of uh, setbacks along the way. 
And I take uh, a great deal of solace in the words of an earlier revolutionary who I think was speaking to us here in the 21st century. It was Tom Paine. And I have found these words to be not only inspiring, but ultimately very, very accurate as well. Tom Paine said, tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. But we have this consolation. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. With those words, I'm happy to open it up to questions and to just let you know, go get them. Thank you very much.